Uh, we're, we're delighted today to have uh, Korea Ambassador Ryan Crocker uh, with us today as the um, after lunch speaker. And uh, just to set the stage, we'll um, I'll do an interview, so to speak. We'll go back and forth on three key topics for about a half hour, and then. Uh, the best part, we'll uh, turn over to the uh, uh, audience for questions and uh, have a discussion with all of you. Um, Ambassador Crocker has had, um, to understate it, uh, probably the most distinguished careers in the history of American diplomacy. Uh, he has been the American ambassador to Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, Kuwait, and Lebanon, in addition to a, an entire range of other diplomatic assignments going back to I think 1972, when you were actually in a consulate in Iran, a very, very different time when he uh, got to know the Iranian people and served in a uh, outlying location in, in Iran. Uh, he grew up in an Air Force family and uh, got a pretty good taste of international matters uh, right from the time that uh, he started. And he has been, uh, importantly, was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the nation's highest civilian award in uh, 2009, and is also of interest an honorary Marine. And there's only 75 honorary Marines in the history of the United States, so it's good to be on the stage with another person in the Naval Service, so <laughs> quite a treat. Uh, okay, so welcome to Ambassador Crocker. And um, the three things we're gonna try to touch on today, consistent with the, uh, the Rumsfeld Foundation, are emphasizing a uh, public service career, uh, matters related to the academic sector, because as many of you know, Ambassador Crocker was the dean of the George Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M uh, for many years and currently serves as a diplomat in residence at Princeton University. And then the, uh, the third topic, which we can uh, touch upon in great detail based upon his diplomatic service, are current events and try to get some of his thoughts about things that are happening in the, the Middle East and, uh, and elsewhere. So before any questions, uh, Ryan, anything you'd like to say at the outset? Well, first, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and my, my thanks to the foundation for, for making it possible. The, I was telling Sarah, the, the, the logistics here are uh, fabulously good. And if you're a speaker and uh, you know you don't have to worry about you know, the plane, the hotel, or anything else, uh, it makes it a lot easier. So th thanks, Sarah, to you and your team. Here, here. <laughs> Yeah, I'll say one, one, one thing. Uh, you mentioned the Medal of Freedom. I'm obviously very proud of that. Only two Foreign Service officers have ever received it. Um, I'm one. Uh, my undergraduate degree was um, contemporary American and British literature with a minor in philosophy from a small small liberal <laughs> arts college. There's somebody out there. Hey. Uh, I, I have no advanced degree, and I never took a course in political science. Um, uh, the other uh, awardee, uh, a foreign service officer named Phil Habib, um, uh, this goes back a fair ways, um, he also did not have an advanced degree. Um, uh, he had a bachelor's degree in forestry uh, from the University of Idaho. Uh, so if anybody out there is thinking of a spectacular uh, foreign service career and what you need to study to get there, go count trees. <laughs> Good advice. Uh, kind of building on that, Ryan, the, uh, we'll stay away from forestry, but nobody applauded when we said that as opposed to philosophy. <laughs> Um, your perspective on a, a public service career, most of all the, uh, the Rumsfeld fellows in the audience going back uh, many years uh, have demonstrated interest in a public service career, which is one of the criteria that we look for in the, the fellows that are uh, selected. Uh, can you uh, talk about some things in terms of your own career that stand out in terms of your dedication to public service and some of the most important lessons you learned along that regard? Well, I, I came to it uh naturally, I guess. My, my father was a career Air Force officer. Uh, he served in uh, the Army Air Corps during World War II. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Eighth Air Force out of uh, UK. Uh, got out uh, like everybody else did uh, in 1945. Couldn't really return to the private sector uh, and recommissioned. 
so I uh, had the privilege as a, as a child, kind of moving around um, Morocco when I was three years old, and Canada when I was in seventh grade, graduated high school in Turkey. Uh, so really almost from uh, age three, I had two things ingrained in me. Um, uh, one was the importance of the international arena. Um, uh, and the other was the notion of public service. Mm -hmm. So I came of age in the late 60s, early 70s, time of course of great uh, ferment uh, in America and in Europe. Um, uh, kids rebelling against their parents and I decided I would rebel against my father. Um, I would um, either join the foreign service or what I thought would antagonize them even more, I would join the Marines. Um, uh, the notion that I wouldn't go into some form of service never occurred to me. Um, and uh, I, I certainly have had no, no regrets uh, looking back on the, uh, the, the, the course I was able to chart. What does it mean in terms of leadership lessons you've had? I know there have been several, but you could, uh, both from the standpoint of the assignments, you've had people you've worked for, or perhaps maybe the, the best DCMs that you've had in all your ambassadorial assignments. Any key takeaways there? Uh, get the right people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, formally, an ambassador can only handpick two members of the staff, the deputy chief of mission yeah. mm -hmm. um, and uh, the executive assistant formerly known as, as secretaries. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in reality, you can jigger a whole lot more things than that. Uh, that. That is absolutely crucial. Such distinction I've had has been because I had really, really good people mm -hmm. uh, who could make me look good. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it is absolutely essential in the Foreign Service. We're a tiny little band. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you have more personnel uh, in a carrier strike force um, than you do in the entire Foreign Service. About 5,000, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so uh, we are, it's all about people. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't have aircraft carriers or other fancy toys. Um, uh, so, so, getting <laughs> uh, so, so getting the right people in the right place uh, just, just counts for the world. Ryan, the, uh, just, just pivoting a little bit, you've had a great background in the academic sector down at College Station and currently at Princeton and also affiliation with uh, other institutions. How do you see the academic sector, which is represented here in the room, uh, any improvements that they can make in terms of uh, turning out students that would be more effective based upon your career experiences? Well, that's a crucial question because academics clearly are important in the policy world. Uh, uh, I, I remedied my, some of my educational shortcomings uh, as a foreign service officer, like the military services, uh, the foreign service will um, send you to graduate school. Mm -hmm. um, and I used that opportunity to study at Princeton um, in their Near East Studies Department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I learned there was hugely useful to me for the entire rest of my career, mm -hmm. getting those academic perspectives. Uh, but it comes with a caveat. Um, uh, academics that can make a positive difference uh, through their scholarship and their teaching and their writing um, are what I would call policy relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they do not write or speak um, as though they were policy makers. Um, others do do that, yeah. and boy, that is where you can get into really bad trouble uh, because it, these are different worlds. The policy mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. and the world of academia, very different mm -hmm. uh, situations. Uh, when you get into policy prescription, um, two, two incidents that I think are worth remembering. One of them was... Um, uh, Iran, 1953, uh, there was a British scholar named Ann Lampton at the time, uh, 
uh, one of the, the, the really great academics on uh, the Persian language and on Iran. <clears throat> uh, she became a driving force behind the British decision to overthrow Mohammad Mossadegh, mm -hmm. uh, the Prime Minister of Iran in 1953. Uh, she convinced uh, MI6, and MI6 convinced the CIA. <clears throat> um, we got into the rent -a mob business, uh, and it worked. And then we started talking about it publicly. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we're still paying for that. Yeah. Um, we, we, are, we are paying for 1953 in 2019, and you see some of the evidence of it, of course, in the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Abkate strikes. Um, the, another example would be Bernard Lewis, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. under whom I had the great privilege of studying in the mid-'80s. After he retired, uh, he apparently decided that it's, um, that, that academic rigor didn't need that anymore, and he could uh, go do something that was a lot more fun, uh, like convincing the, uh, the White House that invading Iraq would be a really good idea. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, policy relevant, not policy prescriptive. Yeah, great points. Uh, with that as kind of a uh, lead in Ryan, why don't we just wade right into current events? And you've already touched on some things relative to uh, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and, uh, and Iran. Uh, well, let's start with Iran. I mean, based upon your uh, experience being assigned there as a diplomat, we won't have too many diplomats left that actually did work in Iran, like you did, I guess, starting in 1972. Um, where do you think we should be relative to our um, policy with Iran and our relationship with them, say, 10 years from now? Um, well, those of you who have Middle Eastern experience, as, as you do, uh, you know that in the Middle East context, a um, an extreme long-range prediction, that would be a week from Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you know, I'm not really sure where we're going to be with Iran at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would just say, uh, looking at Iran um, and looking at some of the things we've been doing, um, I'm starting to get a little concerned, more than a little concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my, my sense of uh, President Trump uh, kind of looking at the decisions he's made on national security and foreign policy, he is a minimalist. Uh, he, he's cautious, uh, kind of contrary to the public image, very cautious about anything to do with the use of American military force. Um, that is not a bad default position for uh, an American president to have, to say the least. Uh, he is not a hip shooter. But we've got a major problem that is now showcased, I think, in the um, Iran-Saudi mm -hmm. set of incidents. Um, he is a minimalist, but the policies he has articulated and that his um, administration is pushing forward are maximalist. Uh, and you see that in particular with Iran. Yeah. Um, um, pulling out of the uh, JCPOA, um, slapping down hard sanctions, setting conditions uh, for the Iranians that they cannot and will not ever meet. Um, uh, the, Irani the Iranians are seeing maximalism here. They are seeing what they consider to be an administration aiming at regime change in Tehran. Mm -hmm. um, and they are responding in a maximalist way uh, to take a step that extreme, and obviously I'm making the assumption that yeah. uh, the Iranians mm -hmm. were behind it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that suggests to me that, that they believe they are in a fight for their, uh, for their lives as a regime. Mm -hmm. um, and the dilemma that the administration now faces, of course, um, is in the Iranian perception and in the perception of much of the world, the end we seek is regime change. Mm -hmm president is not committing the ways and the means yeah. necessary to bring that about. Uh, and when you get that kind of disconnect, uh, you can get into all sorts of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this kind of stuff is, is complex, but it's really, really important. And I'm, I'm just not sure where, um, 
uh, where the president intends to go with this. Yeah. Um, Ryan, Afghanistan. Um, you got called back into active service to be ambassador there after all the other assignments you had had. You've been um, made some really good points, uh, uh, really going back to last, starting in January, or as recently as earlier this month in Foreign Policy Magazine, about um, concerns in terms of reducing our presence there, military and diplomatic, to a very low level that might allow the uh, Taliban to uh, exert even more control and uh, cover more of the limited rural territory they've got today. Uh, what do you think are the most important points in our policy towards uh, Afghanistan as we go into the future? Yeah, it's a, obviously a hugely complex and hugely Im important issue. Um, I, I had the privilege of being um, in Afghanistan on two very different occasions. I, I reopened our embassy um, after the fall of the Taliban. Um, month of December um, 2001, I, I, I began that month um, uh, in northern Iraq, and this was uh, a year and a half before the invasion. I was yeah. uh, dispatched to go meet with the Kurdish leaders to um, basically tell them two things. Uh, uh, do not reignite the Kurdish civil war, mm -hmm. uh, which had uh, split the yeah. Kurdish community very dramatically in 1998, just three years before. That was one, and two was um, uh, don't start the war without us. Mm -hmm. Don't surprise us. <laughs> um, Mid-month, so that was the beginning of the month. Mid-month, uh, I was meeting with the Iranians in Geneva. Yeah. Uh, we had a quiet dialogue going after 9-11 about Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the month, I was on my way to Kabul, yeah. um, even though it was not in my bureau. So, now, The Iranians, there was a big overlap with the Northern Alliance. They were, you know, we had somewhat common concerns in terms of what was going on in northern Afghanistan. That must have been very awkward in terms of the diplomacy in Switzerland. Uh, it, it, it wasn't. It was actually just a heck of a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Iranians had almost gone to war with, uh, with mm. the Taliban in yeah. Afghanistan. There, right. there can only be one Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, this mm -hmm. was an existential issue. Uh, so after 9-11, they saw an opportunity to yeah. team up mm -hmm. with us in this case, and get rid of somebody that neither of us liked. Uh, so they were um, they were they were pretty forthcoming on yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, the. Uh, you talk about the Northern Alliance. Uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards were up there, uh, of course, had been my primary interlocutor. Uh, under diplomatic cover was a Quds Force yeah. officer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he had been their ambassador to Bosnia when Iran broke mm -hmm. the arms embargo, mm -hmm. which we desperately wanted someone to do, um, and they did it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that conversation, that set of conversations was, um, was, was pretty interesting. We talked at one point in Geneva about um, uh, authorizing um, direct liaison between our guys uh, in, um, in the north and their guys in the mm -hmm. north, because as we put all this together, we could, uh, the Northern Alliance was gonna play us off of each other if they possibly could. Mm -hmm. um, and if we were talking directly, we could minimize the chances of that or uh, anything else getting messed up. Um, uh, we were set to do it, that was a step too far at the time for mm -hmm. General Soleimani. Yeah. Yeah. Although, as you're probably aware, there were multiple occasions where U.S. security, military forces, and IRGC forces were providing security for the same meetings in northern Afghanistan, Navy SEALs, in uh, 2002 and even into 2003, which is pretty awkward, but underscores some of the complexity of diplomacy, certainly. Um, Ryan, Iraq. Um, at the risk of being somewhat optimistic, uh, we have a, a government in Baghdad that seems to have control of most of their borders, still some significant sectarian issues between the uh, Sunni and Shia populations and the whole Kurdish issue, which you can uh, put off to the side for a moment. But uh, one that seems to have done uh, fairly good work in terms of uh, winning back territory uh, from the uh, Sunni extremist threat that they had going back two and three years. Um, how would you characterize the current state of um, uh, the Iraqi government and uh, their prospects for the future? Um, 
Well, again, um, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, what I've learned over the years is, uh, you know, you don't end a war by withdrawing your forces. Uh, you simply leave the battlefield to other forces that are uh, more determined and more patient, and that's, of course, what happened in Iraq uh, mm -hmm. after our withdrawal and in, uh, in complete withdrawal in 2011. Um, uh, without us present in a major way, uh, Iraqi leaders uh, defaulted to kind of core positions. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of the Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, uh, his great fear was the return of Baathism. Mm -hmm. um, and given his personal experience, yeah. uh, you know, one could understand that. Mm -hmm. So without us there saying, you cannot possibly give this guy that command, and mm -hmm. we could normally talk him out of it, when, when we weren't doing that anymore, that's where he defaulted. So the only thing he cared about in his senior commanders was loyalty. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he didn't care if they had combat experience. He didn't care if they were good leaders. He wanted to be sure they were loyal because he knew his own history. Um, and that's, of course, what led to the collapse of the Iraqi army as Islamic State mm -hmm. started mm -hmm. surging into the country. Now we have the uh, popular mobilization units or forces, mm -hmm. uh, many of them proxies for Iran, mm -hmm. just as Hezbollah in, in uh, Lebanon was. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have the dream team, if you will, I think from mm -hmm. a standard U.S. perspective, Barham Saleh as yeah. mm -hmm. uh, president of Iraq, someone who knows us very, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, daughter is a Princeton graduate. Um, uh, and Adel Abdel Mahdi, who mm -hmm. yeah. we used to say is, it was the best prime minister Iraq would never have. Mm -hmm. And now we have him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he... Uh, doesn't make a big deal out of it, but he kind of likes us. Mm -hmm. um, um, but here's what else we have. Neither Saleh nor Abdul Mahdi have any local power base at all. Uh, so they are pretty much beholden to mm -hmm. Iran mm -hmm. and um, in particular General, General Soleimani. Yeah. So they're, they're walking a tightrope. Uh, you may have seen some of the statements. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in which they have vociferously denied that the uh, attacks into Saudi Arabia came from Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, where will they go? Where will they go from here? Um, uh, well, they're getting pretty solidly implanted in the Iranian orbit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is not um, entirely problem-free. Um, because of that Iran-Iraq war of the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of hard feelings on both sides. Uh, Iranians will probably overreach. I think mm -hmm. they're doing some of that now. Mm -hmm. And they will get an Iraqi backlash. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, from the Sunnis. I mean, you expect oh, to see the yeah. out of there. So. Uh, uh, the backlash that would count, though, would be from the Shia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that is why the Iranians are paying particular attention right now to Muqtada Sadr. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Sauter's father uh, was a, um, a populist, uh, just revered by the um, uh, working class or sub-working class Shia masses. Mm -hmm. Muqtada does not have the stuff that his father had, um, uh, but the Iranians want to be darn sure he doesn't develop it mm -hmm. against them as, uh, as uh, his, his father had done. So. It's going to be a rocky road. Uh, it, uh, again, kind of depends on us. Um, uh, you know, we, we paid a lot because mm -hmm. of the decision to withdraw our forces. Um, I, again, in the minimalist tradition of the current president, I'm just not sure how much of a commitment yeah. we're prepared to make mm -hmm. and sustain there. Yeah, a key word that um, I think you just used, Ryan, that I was going to ask you the next question about is a sustainable footprint um, in countries like Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, Stan McChrystal always said that the, relative to Iraq, the first question you have to ask yourself, um, probably applies to Afghanistan as well, is where you want to be in the region. How would you uh, envision, say, uh, and again, it's not good to look too far in the future of the Middle East, but something that the American people could view as a sustainable diplomatic and military footprint. 
the countries like Afghanistan and Iraq, they carry on for like the next five, 10, maybe 15 years. I, I really think we're there. I think you know the future could be now. When, when I left um, Afghanistan in, as ambassador in 2012, we had about 100,000 troops on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, now we have 14,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been below that. Um, kind of bumps up and down depending on the, mm -hmm. uh, the conditions. Uh, and President Trump got that right when he announced his uh, Afghan policy uh, a little over two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, saying this is not calendar driven, it's conditions driven. Uh, well, that's what, of course, we said in Iraq as well mm -hmm. as in Afghanistan, and that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you're going by the calendar, uh, then uh, your adversaries know how long they have to wait, mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll wait you out. Uh, so uh, where we are now, again, 14,000 troops, um, staying right around that level somewhere, again, um, mm -hmm. up a bit, down a bit, depending no. on needs. We are not engaged in day-to-day -day combat activities or mm -hmm. uh, our losses, and every loss is a loss. I've stood at enough ramp ceremonies to, uh, mm -hmm. to feel that personally. Um, but compared to what they were, what our losses were when I was there, when mm -hmm. we were in the main fight, uh, it's night and day. Um, and again, without us there as a principal combat force, the uh, Afghan security forces are, are, are sticking with it in spite mm -hmm. of yeah. really horrendous losses. losses. Mm -hmm. Want a metric on that? Uh, well, it wasn't that thing we finally gave up, thank God, last spring, of mm -hmm. talking about percent of land controlled by whom. Mm -hmm. I mean, much of Afghanistan is uninhabited and uninhabitable. It doesn't matter if the Taliban has got a flag in some godforsaken stretch of desert. Yeah. A metric mm -hmm. that does make a difference? Mm -hmm. How many provincial capitals do the Taliban hold? Or, they've got any, do they? Zero. Zero, yeah. yeah. Uh, they, they've, they've, they've got Mazari Sharif in the north for mm -hmm. a few days, but they couldn't they hold it. Out. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the metrics are not bad. And mm -hmm. I, so I think as a, since we've seen the movie before, uh, 9-11, uh, the result of our disengagement mm -hmm. from Afghanistan the first time, uh, it's a pretty cheap insurance policy. So uh, the general idea would be high four figures, very low five figures of troops, heavy diplomacy, and maybe you know, have, have some kind of a coalition with the usual suspects like the UK, Canadians, and Australians, and so on, and just kind of take it from there, and, and to do it on a long-term basis. And, and as you know, uh, the, the Afghan mission is quite popular in NATO. Yeah, um, they they like it, and we like having them. Uh, so uh, it's why I find this initiative uh, the administration took on direct negotiations with the Taliban without the government of Afghanistan present to be just incomprehensible. That was a big inflection point to decide to do that. Boy, it was. And for uh, those of us old enough to remember Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, it looked distressingly like the Paris peace talks yeah. in the early 70s. Um, by giving in to the Taliban's principal demand that, mm -hmm. that they negotiate with us without what they call the stooge government in the room, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, just delegitimizes the government that we have paid mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. to support in blood and treasure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm delighted when the president said, this is over. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If they are restarted, and they will have to be someday, you can't kill your way out of an insurgency, as, as Dave Petraeus has famously said, mm -hmm. has to be a political deal somewhere. Um, but unless we want to do what we did in Vietnam, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it's got to have the Afghan government up front um, from the beginning if there are future talks. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, one final question before we turn it over to the audience. Uh, you've also been the US ambassador to Syria a uh, country that has geographic boundaries, but nothing like the control over them that uh, might have, which of course involves uh, so many key equities throughout the region to include so not uh, just our ties with the Kurdish people, but also the overlap into Iraq, certainly Lebanon, and uh, the Jordanians who we work very closely with. Where do you see Syria in terms of um, any kind of contiguous borders that are controlled by the central government being in the future? It's a great question. Uh, Syria, of course, has disappeared from the, the, the headlines. Um, I mean, the first point to make, that war is not over. Uh, uh, we, Idlib is still out there. Um, uh, the Damascus government does not meaningfully control 
uh, a lot of territory, not just in Idlib. Uh, they've been pretty well drained by this mm -hmm. fight as well. So I, I think you're going to see a, we're in a, something of a lull right now. Uh, uh, as Lebanon was um, after 1976, but that war didn't end yeah, either. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It just came back in different sure. forms. I think you're going to see that in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how do we want to uh, play it? I, I had started out as a strong advocate for a post-ISIS force um, of, of some significance. Mm -hmm. uh, I backed away from that because um, it is so hugely complex and with so many local, regional, and international actors in the same space, frankly, I don't think this administration would be up to the challenge. Okay. Um, uh, so pulling back, keeping an eye on the process, um, I'd like to see us bring it back to Geneva, uh, where we do have a role, instead mm -hmm. of the Astana mm -hmm. process, which of course does yeah. not include us. Yeah. Uh, because again, Syria is a gift that's gonna keep on giving. I don't know in what size, shape, or form, uh, uh, but it is going to affect stability in the region and not for the better, I think, for years to come. Yeah, as I say, it's been uh, removed from the headlines, but it's still probably as concerning as it's ever been. So, Okay, now for the best part of the conversation, over to the audience for uh, questions and comments for Ambassador Crocker. We've got a microphone coming, I think. There we go. <clears throat> Ambassador Crocker, it's a great treat to have you here today. Thank you for joining us all. Uh, could you tell us about the time uh, it was most disappointing to you when your advice was not taken? Um, well, I, <laughs> uh, successive administrations from both parties have uh, routinely ignored my advice, and that's probably, <laughs> that's probably a good thing. Um, uh, it may seem odd, but uh, uh, the worst moment wasn't actually Iraq. I, I um, had been a, uh, let's just say, a skeptic about the uh, good things that would come out of a military invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, um, so that was, that was not good. It, it was particularly not good because I, I kind of knew as I was getting slimed around the interagency for being a defeatist, that, uh, that once we crossed the line of departure, it was going to be my phone that was ringing, uh, mm -hmm. because I had the language, I had served in Iraq, um, um, that I'd be the guy that got to go forward. No. Um, and that's, of course, that's exactly that's what happened. happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the, the worst time was in Lebanon in the mm -hmm. uh, early 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the time of the Israeli invasion yeah. of Lebanon, the bombing of our embassy, a mm -hmm. survivor of that, bombing of the Marine barracks. I was, I was mm -hmm. in Beirut yeah. then. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I had uh, tried extremely hard with uh, a succession of uh, presidential envoys, uh, the worst of whom was McFarlane, um, to say, you are bringing us into the Lebanese Civil War on one side, uh, and that would be the, Le the Maronite Christian Lebanese forces. Um, and in so doing, you're, you're, you're putting us in as a participant in that civil war, and we are going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And we did. I did a dissent um, a submission over a secure phone to, to uh, urge that Washington not authorize what uh, McFarland was pressing them on to, to bring our 16-inch guns offshore uh, into action in support of the Lebanese armed forces. Um, boy, they did it anyway. Uh, uh, tarred us completely as uh, yet another actor in the Civil War, and boy, did we pay for it with a lot of American lives. Yeah, yeah, Lebanon's always been kind of a bellwether, and you saw that firsthand, certainly, and that continues right to the present day. Okay, other questions around the room? Microphone is coming. Thank you again, Ambassador, for your time. Uh, my question was, given that the Foreign Service is such a small uh, cadre compared to the military and yet has such a, such a huge Im impact, what sort of ideas do you think 
should future secretaries of state or others um, implement to either boost the numbers, recruit more, and otherwise increase the impact of the State Department? It, it, it's a great question. Um, the kind of the worst period in my lifetime, at least, for the department and for the Foreign Service uh, uh, was the period in which uh, Rex Tillerson was Secretary of State. Um, I mean, he, he, he froze um, the uh, onboarding of new officers, just froze it. Uh, you can imagine what would happen in a military service if you suddenly aren't commissioning any new second lieutenants or, or ensigns. Um, so it, partly in reaction to that, ironically, we've got more popular support on the Hill than we've ever had. Mm -hmm. uh, so this would be the moment, although I'm not sure it's going to happen with this administration. I'm fairly sure it, it won't. This would be the moment to try to get legislation to increase the numbers in the Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have nearly enough people. Uh, in the military, um, uh, if you don't have an overlap, and often you do, mm -hmm. uh, you will at least have contact <laughs> replacement. Foreign Service almost never can do that. There'll be a gap, and sometimes that gap can be months. Um, we don't have enough officers for a training float, um, uh, which means that the service, the department, are very reluctant to take a high-flying mm -hmm. officer and put her into um, uh, long-term training, National War College, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, because uh, she's gone. Her position is going to be empty. Uh, and you, you just you can't run missions if all of your best people are in some form of training or other. Yeah. Uh, and that, it's, a, it's a huge uh, disadvantage for us. Um, uh, so again, it's tantalizing. I mean, you can see how you could steer some legislation through, mm -hmm. um, but it isn't going to happen unless it's an administration initiative, and I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. It's worth noting that at least uh, two of our recent secretaries of defense have recognized that in spades. Certainly oh, the yeah. work that Bob Gates did to try to transfer funds to the State Department is understanding how things were slightly out of balance there, and also Jim Mattis's famous quote that uh, less diplomacy means I have to buy more ammunition, which is uh, very, very accurate. Okay, follow-on question. Thank you, Ambassador Crocker. I'm John Chorciari. I direct the New Diplomacy Center at the University of Michigan. My question is about Turkey. Uh, additional stresses on the Turkish-U.S. relationship based on Turkey's interactions with the European Union and also with its domestic political uh, development. Uh, I wonder if you could walk us through what you see as some scenarios in which the United States could constructively uh, uh, approach the Turkish government over the next few years to try to solidify that relationship. Yeah, it's a great question, and it is a critical relationship. Um, uh, our um, European allies have done us all a tremendous disservice vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. The um, European position for decades, a couple of decades now, has basically been that uh, Turks are good enough to fight and die for the rest of the West as a founding member of NATO, but they're never going to be good enough to join the Gentlemen's Club of the European Union. Um, Turks are, a, any of you who have been out there, they are a very proud people and they have a lot to be proud of. And it was that um, uh, European attitude that I think contributed significantly to the rise of uh, Erdogan. Mm -hmm. um, having their faces rubbed into uh, their inadequacies as Europeans, mm -hmm. uh, he took a different route, and boy, did it work for him. Uh, now, he is not a complete irrational ideologue. He, he knows the links to the West are vital for the uh, uh, economy of Turkey, and uh, indeed, uh, he does not want to be left alone in the room with the Russians. A long, uh, checkered history there. Um, uh, what can we do about it? Uh, again, sustained diplomacy. Um, uh, in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, in Israel, in Jordan, in Egypt, um, President Trump enjoyed a huge advantage just because he wasn't Barack Obama. 
um, our, our traditional allies and at the time of the change of administrations, uh, our relations were at an all-time low everywhere. Uh, so a great opportunity for the new president to refashion those, uh, uh, those ties, and that's what impelled him, of course, to make his first trip overseas to the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, then Israel. Uh, they were just so darn glad that they had a president, as they thought at the time, who was going to be engaged with our traditional uh, friends in the area, uh, and that included Turkey. The problem, again, this administration has is um, it's been so slow filling positions, no ambassadors to key countries like Turkey, like yeah. Saudi Arabia, for a couple of years. Um, it, you can't do diplomacy if you don't have diplomats. Uh, you can't sustain uh, and develop a relationship and a dialogue unless you can keep at it steadily. Uh, so I think the opportunity is still there in, in Turkey and elsewhere. Uh, uh, but we've got to step into it. And uh, we've, we've, uh, we've wasted a lot of time and opportunities. And if we don't move and act, they will move and act on their own. And that's what we saw with the Saudi uh, air war in Yemen. Uh, why they, uh, the Saudis didn't ask us, they told us. They told us about 48 hours out. Uh, and they only told us because they needed enablers. Uh, they didn't do it in Washington, they did it at CENTCOM. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. For a yeah. diplomat of my generation, that would be unthinkable, that, that the Saudis would move on their own. But they felt that the Obama administration wasn't going to be out there to back them, and they would. Mm -hmm. It's also true in Turkey. So. Um, uh, we need to recognize that Turkey is a linchpin, uh, looking both east and west, uh, and and uh, and act accordingly. And does Erdogan do a lot of stuff we don't like? And do the Saudis do a lot of stuff we don't like? And the Egyptians? Yeah, you bet they do. Mm -hmm. um, but here's the thing about the Middle East: uh, you, you don't have the luxury of choices, say, between uh, uh, stable democracies uh, and harsh autocracies, yeah. mm -hmm. because there aren't any stable democracies except for Israel and how stable it is after this second attempt at an election I think is now open to question. You got a choice between the forces of order and disorder in my view. Uh, uh, the forces of order are the countries I've named. Uh, they have been our traditional allies in the area. We let those relationships deteriorate. We've got a chance to build them back that we're not taking full advantage of. Uh, but that, that's where this needs to go. Do we, do we lead, are we engaged, or aren't we? And I don't think this administration has fully answered that question. And diplomacy and uh, the military, and uh, particularly in the intelligence world, uh, Ryan, I think you'd say that you have to deal with a lot of foreign counterparts that you'd rather not deal with. But, uh, it's part and parcel of the business. I think the other part in terms of, uh, you know, the arc of diplomacy and the effectiveness of um, U.S. diplomacy, I think a lot of us expected, uh, both of us have some gray hair, but like during the Bush 41 administration, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, and he had Brent Scowcroft as a national security advisor, just, just a vigorous, I mean, and it was the, the fall of Berlin Wall and events that took place with uh, Kuwait and so on. But the, um, the ascendancy of American diplomacy during that era was something that a lot of us expected would continue pretty much at that kind of arc. And it's, um, uh, that doesn't happen. Why, why would you say so? Well, the, the Bush 41 presidency was a, a unique moment yeah. in our modern history. Uh, we have never had, and I think we will never have again, um, a president with as much experience in the um, uh, national security and foreign affairs field than he had. I mean, I, you know, and my, his team too. I mean, his well, team and that's the yes. I mean, it was a, you know, it it was a stunning moment mm -hmm. uh, when you had, you know, the president, of course former ambassador to the United Nations, our first envoy to China, director of central intelligence. Uh, he knew how the world worked. Uh, and precisely because he knew how the world worked, uh, he knew he couldn't manage it all himself, and he put together the dream team. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dick Cheney is Secretary of Defense. Colin Powell he lucked into as, mm -hmm. as chairman. Um, uh, Brent Scowcroft, Jim Baker. Yeah. It doesn't mm -hmm. get better than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he lost the election. Uh, and we got President Clinton, who had none of that, um, and none of that background. And when people don't have the background, they tend to choose other people more like them uh, than those who are really proficient in it. So we've not had a really great run uh, internationally over the last uh, couple of presidents. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, back to the audience. Follow on questions. Back here. Microphone's on the way. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Crocker. Um, I have a, a Henry now, by the way, at, uh, from George Washington University, a faculty advisor. Uh, I'm going to ask a question, which I don't, the premises of which I don't entirely share, but I think it's a very real one. That is, the American people have said now in the last three elections and probably in a fourth election next year, we don't want to be more engaged in these parts of the world. We want you guys, you the experts, we want you to figure out how we can manage our basic interests, which is terrorism and the prospects of another attack on the United States or its allies, how we can do that with as few people as possible and with zero casualties, if possible, like we eventually did in the former Yugoslavia. What would you advise? I mean, because that seems to me to be a real gap between what the experts say is needed and what the public is saying they will tolerate. Well, in one word, it's leadership. Um, kind of looking at our, our leaders in, in recent years, it reminds me of that old uh, adage, uh, uh, tell me where my people are going so I can lead them. Um, uh, you know, you don't lead from the rear. Uh, um, so, you know, take Iraq, for example. Um, so the American people um, uh, voted to have a, um, a big old war in Iraq in, in the 2002 congressional elections. Um, um, and we had that, uh, we got that big old war, and in the next cycle through in 2006, um, the American people voted not to have a big old war in Iraq. Um, but we were already there. Uh, so uh, it's, um, it's, it's Oval Office leadership to explain to the American people um, what is going on in the world and why that is important to us, fireside chats. Uh, no. <laughs> but, but for the, the, the president to be leading a national conversation on the role of the United States in the world. Uh, because what we've seen now with President Obama and uh, on steroids with President Trump a disengagement, that we are pulling back, um, that the post-World War II international construct, which we built, uh, United Nations created in San Francisco, the post-war international monetary order, moving the world from the gold standard to the dollar, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Uh, so we designed it and we led it, Republicans and Democrats, basically for better or for worse uh, until uh, 2009. Uh, and President Obama started pulling back on things. I would still call him an internationalist. Uh, the the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, the Climate Accords in Paris, uh, the JCPOA, um, all of those things have been ripped up by President Trump. And it's happening without a national discussion. Um, what are the implications and consequences uh, if America no longer pursues that post-World War II leadership role? Um, uh, I can think of a lot of outcomes, and all of them are bad. Um, uh, but you, you got you to gotta have a conversation, and that has to start from the White House. You know, what is the president's vision for America in the world as we conclude the second decade of this century? Uh, President Obama didn't do that. President Trump isn't doing it. Uh, and frankly, that uh, it, concern, it used to concern me. Now it's starting to scare me. Uh, it's not that the Chinese are going to take over our leadership role. It's that they can't, that no one can. So what do you get? We seem to be kind of stumbling toward a balance of power world. Uh, well, a balance of power world is what got you World War I. Um, um, and a 20-year truce between that and World War II without U.S. leadership. Um, so if that's where we're going, if that's what we're reverting back to, fasten your seatbelts. Um, can I say with authority that we are? No, I can't, because we're not having a conversation. Uh, so I, I, I worry about a lot of stuff, but at the macro level, it, it's just that, that uh, we, we seem to be moving away 
as a population, certainly, and you know, isolationism has always been a current mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. thinking, mm -hmm. but we have not had presidents who are prepared to say, here's my vision for America and my vision for America in the world. Uh, that is a conversation we badly need to have, and uh, I would not hold my breath that we're going to get it in the uh, presidential campaign that's underway. Okay, great point. So we have time for one more question, and whatever the question uh, is, it has to be a really upbeat, positive answer next time, okay? So, final question from around the room. We're here. The question has to be upbeat too, by the way, oh, okay? Yeah. So. <laughs> this is uh, sort of a question, but a really funny story uh, with Ambassador Crocker. It was about five years ago, maybe six years ago, at a talk you gave in Los Angeles, where you gave a very dismal outlook about Syria. And uh, he said, I don't want to uh, end this on an entirely bad note. Uh, so the good news is, today is better than it's gonna be tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> You're right about that. <laughs> so, it was on the mark. <laughs> That was just so good, I, I, I never forget it. Um, so uh, where will uh, tomorrow be better than today? Um, well, yeah, it depends on how big an area you, um, you want to look at. If you're going to restrict us to this solar system, I don't see it. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, I, I just go back to what I said. I, I am I am really concerned that we are almost by accident shifting away from an American-led international order uh, into some kind of informal balance of power construct. Um, you know, that when I look at things uh, relevant to Syria, the uh, the Astana process, so-called, um, involving. Uh, 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 Turkey, Iran, and Russia, and not us. Um, you know, the assertion by Iran of its regional role, um, uh, the Russians are back. Uh, it, it's one order that has really directed the world since World War II now giving way to something that isn't even being articulated. Uh, and I, I find that very, very worrisome. It is indeed, but the, I think the students, the Rumsfeld Fellows in this room are gonna to have to deal with this, and I, my feeling is you're gonna be able to figure it out because the <laughs> vacuum created internationally for the United States leadership will be there. And, and just one other point I'd make, Ryan, and you see this all the time too, the people that come after the talks you give from the back of the room from countries like Tunisia, Japan, South Korea, uh, Chile, Colombia, I mean, they all say, we really want you guys to get more involved, and I think that demand signal, that vacuum that's out there is going to make a big difference in the uh, future, and I think the uh, students, the Rumsfeld Fellows in this room is going to be part of that, so we look forward to you guys figuring it out. Most of all, uh, please join me in thanking Ambassador Crocker for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great conversation. <laughs>